it's, it's about what you said at the beginning of your presentation. This uh, difference which has to be done between, uh, let's say, uh, cannibalism for survival, for survival, necessity, and on the other hand, okay, uh, cannibalism as a cultural issue. Um, what's uh, a bit uh, enigmatic about these cases of cannibalism um, in South, in, in, so in, in the Imperial Army, uh, from soldiers, Japanese soldiers, that of course, of course, starvation, so, okay. Uh, cannibalism for survival was frequently the case. So Japanese soldiers had to eat uh, natives, dead uh, comrades, uh, etc. But it seems, it seems, according to the available documentation, that there was another dimension that is organized, something which was more organized, including by officers. That is, all units which were involved, uh, active in this kind of practice, which tended to become systematic in some cases. And of course, this is something very different. So according to testimonies, notably from Western prisoners who survived, it happened. Uh, so that uh, in uh, Tokyo, the, the trial in Tokyo, uh, uh, officers, even high-ranking officers were sentenced for this kind of of crime. Um, in the available documentation, we can find two uh, examples. One high-ranking officer, Yoshio Tashibana, who was, I don't know if it's how it's, general, like some kind of a general, it seems, was judged in Tokyo for having prepared or ordered, I quote, a feast at which um, U.S. Uh, Air Force men who had been taken prisoner so was eaten after so some kind of a banquet after having been beheaded. This is one example. And another case, Vice Admiral Mori, Mori uh, would have eaten a prisoner uh, on the occasion of uh, his reception, and this in February 40, 45. And of course, this kind of case is much more would say puzzling for us because uh, it's quite different from, from survival cannibalism because uh, the dimension of voluntary, I would say, decivilization in that case is obvious. It's from war to something else. It's not only war. It's going or pushing to the end. I mean, the barbaric dimension of this kind of war, going okay, to the very end of it. So exhibiting, exposing through this kind of very provocative uh, practice. But OK, we, uh, we are out of any kind of norms of patterns. Maybe we we'll begin with the pictures on black rain. 
So we go back to Hiroshima, I guess it's okay. Black rain, 11 minutes, the beginning of the film. Then I will make a brief uh, comment. Okay, sorry for the very bad quality of these pictures, but at least you had you had an idea of what a uh, very apocalyptic representation of disaster is. And you had the, the worst of all, which is the kind of music you have with these yes. pictures. Okay, we'll say now a few words on Black Rain. It was in uh, uh, last week's uh, paper. We talked about the text. So, um, if you watch these 11 first minutes uh, of the film, you, you will notice how close the opening of the film, Black Rain, is to the beginning of Children of Hiroshima, if you remember. That is the same kind of opening early in the morning on the 6th of August. Uh, people getting ready to, for work, everything normal and quiet in the city. You see animals, a bird, a crab just crawling about quietly on the beach. A young woman with the narrator and with the witness uh, of um, the disaster comments uh, this normal situation in voiceover. You see a man in uniform who makes his preparation for departure to the factory where he works. Uh, it's sunny day, uh, summer day, very hot, and suddenly you see this small, very small object in the sky, white parachute, and something hanging from it, very small in the white sky, and looking like blood, very harmless, and it is the bomb. And then again, like in Children of Hiroshima, the clock of all, the white lightning, the music which is helping, backing up, underlining the horror of the scene, the horror of the instant, and this uh, young woman, like uh, the children of Hiroshima, the schoolmaster, with her ingenuous and pretty face. Uh, and who is, uh, of course, a symbol of innocence and youthfulness. And she, as the witness, will face the apocalyptic incident. She is the witness uh, of horror and terror. As uh, in the other film, the uniqueness of this disaster is stressed in these scenes. The shadow of the clock's needle, which has been printed on the face of the clock. The witness uh, who are on the fish boat uh, are, are taken out from the sea. In the, the scene which corresponds to this one in Children uh, of Hiroshima, it's a man's shadow who was sitting on stone steps and his shadow is printed on the step and the man has disappeared. The body itself has vanished. And we see uh, in black rain how night falls in the middle of the morning and this under the effect of the explosion. We see how a black rain falls all around the devastated city mixture of ashes, all kind of fragments of all sorts of things, and rain. And the survivors on the boat ask, this, ask themselves what's happening, and they have the immediate intuition of that something radically new has happened uh, at that exact time uh, which is printed on the top. So um, 
there's no doubt that Imam Muhammad, Imam Muhammad is a great artist. Uh, and uh, he's really one of the contemporary Japanese directors I admire most. I can mention films like, maybe you know some of them, Pigs and Battleships on the Initial after war in Japan, Echa Kanaka, Kanaika, a beautiful film on traditional customs in traditional Japan, the famous ballad of, ballad of Nahayama, The Eel, uh, which uh, received um, gold form in uh, Cannes, and the festival of Cannes. Dr. Akagi, another film on the Second World War. Maybe we have an occasion to talk about it. Uh, Warm Water and the Red Bridge, and of course, also Black Rain, which, which is actually a wonderful, a wonderful film on collective memory and on disaster. All this, I insist on this, all this belongs to my personal Pantheon. But, but, there is a doubt. I must say that there is something I have to object very strongly in the sequence we have just seen. That is, the young woman uh, on her uh, own walking through the ruins and seeing these horribly burnt survivors. This image of the schoolboy um, is uh, and the uh, brother doesn't recognize him because he's so horribly burned, his flesh just uh, melting. And also this picture of the woman who rocks the colonized baby, etc. Um, I would like to insist on this. The problem, question, it is is not at all about proof, the truth. That is, it is not uh, a question of knowing if things of that kind did happen this day or not. If such scenes uh, were not survivor uh, see in the hours or in the days that followed the atomic explosion. This is not the question. Of course, these survivors did, they could see things of that kind. And I would add even they could see much worse. That is, a lot of things which no film at all could depict or reconstruct. Um, so the problem is not at all about exaggeration or things like that. On the opposite, I would say such a depiction can only be very, actually, a paid, a very paid image of what could be seen by witnesses at that moment and under these circumstances. So the question is not about what is real or not. Uh, it is, the question is about the relation between facts, things what happened, situations, Past, past situations, the relations between that and narratives, and narratives. It is, the question is no, no, how a narration of such an event, as it is unique, and as it bears the sign of absolute exception, how it can be not just true to the fact, but liable to make of us 
not only horrified, terrified witnesses of the disaster, or even worse than that, of course, uh, pure and simply fired, so the living comes of the catastrophe, may make out of us subjects um, empowered with, uh, I would say, Uh, as much as possible, critical abilities and this uh, in front of the situation which opens up at, the, at that place and at that instant, that is Hiroshima, this very day and at this uh, time. This is for me the question we have to, we have to ask ourselves. And I'm not sure, I would even say I'm not sure at all, that the aesthetic choice which consists in presenting is hyper-realistic pictures, and so, and this according to literal uh, patterns of representation of this copy. I'm not sure that this is the best, wisest choice uh, in such uh, a case. Uh, it is not, I think, uh, this event, this uh, historical object, is not a case of weak reaction, like in the Son et Lumière show. We are, rather, in the case of recollection or restitution, which goes necessarily through the path of collective memory and not through the art and talent of, let's say, a cinematographic mortician, as we have a mortician in, in the, the film on uh, engine. And this is the reason why I would like to contrast, to try to contrast the aesthetic choice, which is uh, made by Imam Moura in Black Rain with other possible aesthetic choices and for example with the choice which is at work in Rhapsody in August by Akira Kurosawa which is exemplary for me and of course later uh, uh, with the choice which, is, which has been made uh, earlier, much earlier uh, by uh, Alain René in the classical Hiroshima Mon Amour. So, okay, that's what I want to say on this few comments. Um, anything? We can listen to them. So just before I would say a few words, just a so, remark. Uh, before we pass to perhaps in August, we'll see, so right, um, maybe 40 minutes or something, because I think it's worth right, see this and then I will comment a bit. So, on the question of witnessing, last time you, you, you said, uh, you made remarks on the witness, you said we, we have to go deeper in it. So, I will add some something on this um, on this question on this issue. So, so what I'm trying to be the witness of. So as we see these clips from Japanese films on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it is of course my own perplexity. So I want to testify about the feeling of discomfort. They can give rise to as I watch these uh, pictures. So the reflection, it's, it's about the, the uncanny, the eerie, uh, as uh, something like a warning signal, when we, this kind of feeling uncanny. Uh, and this means that I have to question myself about these pictures. Uh, about their statues as traces of the disaster. 
as part of a narration. And of course, these pictures, as they come under a certain regime of pictures, uh, literally translated from French. Uh, I don't know how to say it. <coughs> but of course, this doesn't mean that, and this is the important point, uh, this doesn't mean at all that I'm the judge of these pictures, or even less that I'm the judge of their author, of the artist. My position is not that of the judge, but of the critical subject, which, let's say, the philosopher but can be something else. Never mind. This is not the important issue. I mean, the critical subject who questions himself on the relations between his capacity, let's say, to reason, in general, to be argumentative, to hold a critical position in the present, and also, of course, the relativity of his cultural position, where he comes from, etc. So in this position, in between, I cannot judge these pictures saying, oh, they are just immoral, they are unacceptable, they are inappropriate. And this, because if I judge this way, this peremptory way, it would, of course, be equivalent to the restoration of the authority of the Western narrator, whose legislation should be, in that case, exerted without any limitation. And so I only can take my own sensibility as a guide which puts me on the track of intercultural dissent. And this is what I'm interested in, not judging. So it's different. It's different if I am if I have to, to take a stand in front of products of let's say Western cultural industry, Hollywood, French or never mind. This is not important. It's different in that case. Why? Because in that case, I do not judge according to so-called universal principles or patterns. I just give a statement. I express myself on what I am called, but it's from Michel Foucault, the intolerable what I cannot stand, just simply like this, what I cannot stand. Um, of course, it is, there is a moral background for this, or a ethical background for this. It is, if you want, a very soft version of Kant's moral philosophy. But actually, it's the way uh, it works. I am certain, have no doubt, and this for a lot of reasons, that the use of suspense as a process, as a narrative device, or rather gimmick, in a film like Schindler's List, the clip we saw last week, but I would almost say the same about the flowers of war, despite of the fact that the uh, filmmaker is Chinese, because basically it is sometimes for the Western. I am absolutely certain that in that case, the use of suspense, it is a dirty trick. And that the artist, actually, this guy salesman, is misleading his audience. That he doesn't respect the historical event itself he's dealing with. So that's why, in such a case, in such a case, I can very quietly uh, say, oh, it's just a crush. Because I have the feeling that I know in that case, I know what I'm talking about. And on the other hand, I also have to take a stand 
I have to be peremptory uh, because okay, the way we have to be critical subjects and not only consumers you know, to take what uh, our cultural industries uh, uh, want to sell them. Okay, we have to be critical subjects in our present. So we have to say something about the intolerable. When we meet the intolerable, we have to take a position, to take a stand, we have to open our mouth about any kind of object, uh, uh, artistic objects, uh, cultural objects, to our course. But when I'm trying to connect to the sequences of the Japanese films we are talking about, that's quite different. My reservations on these pictures have much in common with what we, in the West and in the great uh, Socrates uh, tradition, what we consider as the inaugural gesture in philosophy that is astonishment. Being astonished. Astonishment, which can take many forms, have many different tones, forms of expression amazement, uneasiness, confusion, bewilderment, surprise, etc. So a philosophical attitude consists of us uh, in testifying about our surprise, about our bewilderment, or even more, uh, say, about our open negative or allergic feelings. And this, by contrast, with the attitude which very often consists in aligning oneself in social norms. That is, when we have to face this kind of strange exotic object, let's say, masking any potential matter of disagreement, uh, giving way to politeness and social harmony, and this always to the detriment of sincerity, and just saying, oh, what a beautiful thing, what a and which means exotic in uh, what impressive uh, pictures, uh, disaster, uh, or exotic, uh, etc. So, uh, in this um, situation, this configuration, the game of the Socratic outsider uh, is to ask insistently. Uh, very silly questions, nine questions, like what I do insistently. Did you, have you really listened to, to this music uh, which uh, backs up the apocalyptic pictures of the disaster? What do you think about this kind of music? And what about this, uh, as we saw in, uh, in, uh, in the, the animated film, uh, these eyes which pop out of the child's face, or that red dog which uh, literally is, it melts, melts under the effect of the heat, that during the explosion, there again, yes, there again. Of this kind, asking this kind of silly question. But uh, asking, just asking, sincerely asking, expecting answers from the other, I mean from the insiders. But these questions, all these doubts, all these uh, mental uh, reservations, they are not judgments. It's quite different. They are not judgments. Or if there would be judgments, of course, I hope that the insiders would have very good reasons to ask, uh, talk, but who has a point if you ask? Judge in that case. So, okay, this was in relation to last week's uh, discussion. So, I shall so give a very brief comment on this. So, as you see, in this film, the, the young woman who were the witness uh, at the time of the explosion in the other films. 
children of Yoshi not recommend this young woman has become half more, almost half a century later, a grandma. As you see in the film, she is not vindictive, she is not beaten, she is not angry. And those who have committed the unpunished crime, Nagasaki, but she firmly rejects any kind of oblivion. She rejects the attitude of those opportunist Japanese of that time, that is the generation of uh, children who behave as if Hiroshima Nagasaki had never taken place. And this, as you saw, in order to see to their business quietly and to devote all their efforts to the improvement of their material and professional condition. So it is important for her that her grandchildren know about the place, about the circumstances in which their grandfather, a school teacher, uh, like uh, in children of, of Hiroshima, has been killed as his school was burned. This other bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. She cares for the memory of those who have known this horrible and unjust death. She performed the funeral rites scrupulously with other war widows. She lives in the present. She takes care of her grandchildren. She talks with her neighbors. She is not, in that sense, a captive of the past. She is not hallucinated by the memory of the bomb as the old man was in uh, um, the preceding in my course of hiding here. But still, she is haunted by the disaster. She is very vulnerable and the memory of the traumatic past overwhelms her as she sees in the sky above the mountains the eye, the eye of the nuclear explosion the white light in the clouds. <clears throat> there is no ostentation in the way she keeps the memory of the disaster, of the crime. No ostentation in her position as a memory keeper, memory watcher. But we detect from many signs that the past even Nagasaki lives on in her. Her position contrasts with all the impressions we have from the city of Nagasaki, let's say as a uh, salary in the present. And for us, with the Anders notices in one of his books on Hiroshima, the very quick reconstruction of the martyr cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, after the atomic destruction, this has to be called the destruction of the destruction. And this, as you saw, in spite of the multiplication of commemorative monuments and memorials. The reconstruction wipes up the traces of the disaster and makes the disaster unreal and more unconceivable, unimaginable than ever. So the grandma is not anti-American. But she is just a bit circumspect, reserved, as she hears about this Japanese American family from Hawaii, the family of an alleged elder brother of her. She has completely forgotten about, for she had so many brothers, and for all this or so, such a long time ago. She feels that this distant branch of her family is closer to the criminal power, which never expressed any regret about the destruction of Nagasaki than to her grandchildren, descendants. And she wants to let these people from Hawaii uh, know that she has not forgotten and that this crime divides them. Of course, she is ready to come closer to them, that is to accept the invitation from Hawaii, 
but not before having, as she does every year, attending, attended the commemoration of the destruction of Nagasaki, which is also the anniversary of her husband's violent death. And this is the way she reminds the forgetful, that is her children, uh, of her memorial duty. She reminds them that some, some deeds and actions are unforgettable, that some crimes are imperceptible. And on this issue, she rejects vehemently her son's and daughter's in law attitude who just out of pure opportunism, cowardice, have concealed uh, from the Hawaii branch of the family that her husband has been killed uh, on the day uh, of the bombing of the city. And it is interesting that in the film, the agent of this uh, nearing rapprochement between the two camps uh, in terms of collective memory, is this um, half-caste person that is Ranma's forgotten brother's son, so Clark, the American, who is a very sensitive guy, uh, of course from his culture, from his milieu, from his mother tongue, he's an American before all, but he knows, he will know how to appease, to reassure the old lady, and how to make the symbolic gestures that can alleviate a moral pain. This character shows that Kurosawa, in this late part of his work, it's one of his last films, maybe the last one, I'm not sure, he develops a very, I would say, open approach on this question, that is this crime in the form of heirs. But of course, but Clark is an individual, is a human and humane person, but and he is not that he is not in the film at this place as a character, the spokesman of anybody, and not in particular of uh, the government of the United States or the American people in general. And on this issue. I think it could be interesting to compare Kurosawa's approach of the question with what Kensabu uh, Oe writes in his well-known book, Notes on Hiroshima. Um, another interesting thing, it is about the children, the children in the film, the new generation. They are very obviously and very strongly in a break with they are forgetful parents on this issue. And they do feel that their grandma does that there is something quite wrong in the denial and in the neglect of the crime. They are in want for appeasement and redress, and Clark knows how to offer them both. Again, the grandma is not accusing, she is not incriminating for her basic conviction is that all this, when all uh, is said and done, it is, as she says twice in the film, as she repeats, it is the fault of war. It is nobody's fault in particular. It is the fault of war which makes humans mad and irresponsible. But still, she is convinced that memory the memory of what, of what happened and whose traces should never disappear. Memory has to be kept. Memory has to be cultivated. And that means for her kept alive in the present. And she is not alone in this, this, uh, this state of mind. The, so the old ladies whose husband died under the bomb, they do build up, they form a community whose task it is to keep the memory of the disaster. And this group, this community of 
all ladies, they know how to communicate with one another, and it's without speaking, just by being together and keeping the flame 